Welcome to the Polycyc Podcast. This is your host, Anthony Lindsay. And Stephanie Moreno. All right, we're here with uh, Caroline Black. Her dissertation was on surgical applications for robotics. So what are some of the advantages of using robotics for surgical procedures? I figured it would allow for more precision, but I thought we were at least a few years from its application. So there's actually a lot of robotic procedures that are being performed today. Uh, The Da Vinci surgical robot is one of the more popular consumer um, commercial products that they're using, Um, and they use them for a lot of um, gynecological and urological procedures, Um, so it's more abdominal surgery. So the way that the Da Vinci works is it has these trocars where uh, these tools are inserted into the abdomen, and then the surgeon can move them with a console that he actually is controlling the robot um, remotely. He's sitting in the same room with the robot, but he's controlling it remotely via a um, control console that's kind of off to the side. Wow. So robotic surgery is definitely a reality. It's, it's happening all the time, um, and we keep finding new applications and, and new challenges with it. Um, the difference between that type of Uh, procedure and the stuff that I was looking at is um, the da Vinci is considered a rigid robot where the links and the joints aren't flexible. So the robots that I've been looking at are made of continuous material, meaning that they are uh, flexible and they can bend and um, kind of move around when you push them. So it's kind of the difference between like pushing on a stick and pushing on like a flexible bendy straw, you know, and mm. one of those is going to be much more flexible than the other. So that's, um, that's the research that I've been doing. So the, when I think of robotics, like they would do a micro procedure, like inside of you, it, it would be stiff. It would be stiff and it would be like kind of rudimentary, like, but the new wave of robotics where every piece of it can move. How long do you think before we, that is in full blast and that's in every procedure? Well, I think every procedure is going to have to be handled kind of differently. There there are a lot of different types of surgical procedures and right now the the big push has been for minimally invasive procedures where they make of course very small incisions and then they insert the tools into those small incisions. That is opposed to an open surgical procedure where they make large incisions and kind of, you know, spread everything out, and um, the, the benefit of a minimally invasive procedure is, you know, you have a much smaller wound, so your healing time is much faster, and then you're also at a much larger um, decreased risk for infection. So those are all really great benefits for the patient, but it has made the surgery a little bit more difficult for the surgeons because you do have such a small space that you're allowed to work in. So it does require some extremely uh, accurate dexterity and uh, manipulability of the tools. So that's where the robotics has helped. As far as, you know, having the, the next big kind of wave that people are going to is natural orifice surgery, where now I don't even make an incision. I go through some orifice that's already in the body, like the mouth, and I travel down the throat or the esophagus, and I do my procedure, whatever I need to do via that uh, natural opening in the body. The problem with that procedure is you have to navigate a fairly complex path in order to make it to the surgical site. So that's kind of where these flexible robots come in. Uh, They need to be able to navigate these complex paths in order to reach their final destination and perform their task. Um, And that's something that, you know, is difficult for the da Vinci because it's got these long, rigid arms and it can't really navigate those complex paths. So can you explain uh, the the force sensing controls and how concentric tool manipulators can make the tools that we have now uh, more accurate? So the force sensing is really important because when you have these very small openings, Um, and you have these very delicate procedures and you're trying to minimize the 
trauma or the damage that you do, you need to be able to very accurately measure the amount of force that you're putting on the tissue. So measuring the force at the tip of a manipulator can be very tricky, especially when you want that manipulator to be very small. Um, force sensors, you know, while force sensors are getting very small, we are talking about, you know, on the scale of, you know, five to 10 millimeters. So uh, force sensors get, uh, they struggle to be that small. And so what we would like is to have the ability to sense the forces at the tip of the robot without actually having any sensors at the tip of the robot. So the force sensing analysis that I did was I used the forces that are placed on the flexible links of the robot at the tip, and I measured them at the base of the robot. So all of my force sensors are at the, the other end of the robot, and they're measuring what's happening at the tip. And through some complex modeling of those flexible links, I can actually sense the forces at the tip without having to have sensors at the tip. I'm only measuring things that are happening you know, at the base of the robot. Mm -hmm. So that's going to provide really critical information to the surgeons so that they can ensure that they're not inflicting high enough forces, say, to you know, perforate the colon or maybe tear through some of the lung tissue that they're operating on, things like that. Robotics sound like the solution for future surgical techniques that were once incredibly risky and complicated, like you were mentioning in your, uh, in your research that, you know, some of the procedures that are difficult to get to just with, uh, like, surgeons' hands, now we can get to them with, with robotics, um, maybe less invasively or in a more strategic manner. What would you say to surgeons if and, and or patients who resist the new technology, arguing that human instinct and human touch is still superior, not to be replaced by mechanical instruments? There are two sides to the argument. There are a lot of people who think that the, the advances that we've made in surgical robotics thus far have been kind of, they, they haven't made leaps and bounds in terms of benefits to the patient. Because before we had robotic surgery, of course, we had laparoscopic surgery where we made those small incisions. Mm -hmm. And instead of a robot inserting tools into the small incisions, the uh, surgeon was actually still controlling manual tools. Mm -hmm. And they've done studies where they kind of tried to measure the difference between the laparoscopic procedure and the robotic laparoscopic procedure. And while the surgeon who's using the manual tools still does a really great job at the surgical procedure. Um, the robot does kind of, you know, a comparable job, but there's still a surgeon um, controlling that robot. Sure. So we don't really have, you know, the full measurement of the surgeon versus the robot <laughs> because the robot is still being controlled, you know, by a surgeon. So I do think that there are limitations to what a surgeon-controlled robot can improve upon in terms of, you know, the surgical time, the amount of time it takes to do the surgery, the, you know, the smaller the, the incisions that can be made with robotic tools. I think that those are comparable in terms of performance. Um, and that's been the really big kind of controversy over using robots for laparoscopic surgery. They there are a lot of surgeons that say they're expensive and they don't really improve the surgical procedure for the patient. It's really just, you know, a fancy toy for the surgeon to, yeah. you know, get a little bit faster. So I do think that, that those arguments are valid based on the data that they have uh, studied. But I think the, the big leaps that we're going to see are these robots that don't have to make incisions and these flexible robots that can, you know, sense the forces and provide surgeons with that feedback that they're missing with these current uh, robotic tools. Because you're right, as soon as they put a robotic tool between them and the patient, they can't really feel what's going on anymore. Yeah. And they're not, as, they're not as aware of the forces that they're placing on the tissues. So I think the, the big leaps that we're going to see are when robots are able to 
provide that information again to the surgeons that haptic it's called haptic feedback um, so if they're able to provide haptic feedback to the surgeon and they're also able to automate portions of the procedure we've seen a lot of robots that are starting to do um, incisions that are you know much straighter and more precise than something that a surgeon could do we're also seeing robots that are doing um, stitching uh, like um, stitching together the, the wound once the procedure's finished. Um, and those can be very precise, even mm-hmm. more precise than a, a surgeon could do. But until we see the robots become really more of a partner in the surgical process instead of a tool, I think that, you know, there there are going to be people that still argue that it's not a um, – not a very productive thing to add to the surgical procedure. That makes sense. I'm sure they're really expensive as well. But I, I don't know. I guess I could see it almost as like a bridge to the to that phase where the robotic is seen as a partner. Like right now, still need the surgeon to use it, but maybe that makes it a little less scary of a transition for the future. Um, I think so. I think people getting people more comfortable with the technology and allowing them to kind of get used to the idea of, a robot being a part of their, you know, procedure, I think is, is very helpful. And I, it's also, you know, the other side of the argument is that including robots in procedures does seem to make it easier on the surgeons. So there's been a lot of research centered around how long it takes a surgeon to get proficient at a particular surgical procedure. And most of the time you have to do, you know, maybe 100 or 150 procedures before you're very proficient at, you know, the, the techniques and the different um, types of, of uh, movements that you have to do for that procedure. And they do see that robotics kind of speed up that process of learning the, the procedure and it makes, makes the procedure easier for the surgeon, at oh, least. That's great. So are all policies yeah. and liability issues up to date with the with the creation of the new robotics tools, or are there some snags to still get through to get like insurance and bureaucracy on board? I would imagine there would be still some resistance in the in the in the business offices to uh, evolving past the current right. tools. I know that um, Da Vinci, uh, the Da Vinci is approved by the FDA and. You know, you can you can use it as a part of the, the surgical procedure. As far as, you know, some of the other devices and, and things, um, I think they're still working through, you know, exactly how to incorporate those into the, the billing and, and things for surgical procedures. Um, it's, it's definitely a work in progress because yeah. they have to maintain – a lot of the different standards that are associated with like the Wi-Fi signals in the surgical suite and like how all of the things are operating together. And so I think a lot of the the new kind of policies that have been created are centered around how to incorporate this new piece of machinery into an existing uh, surgical suite. And so they have to maintain all of the um, – the signaling, but then they also have to maintain um, all of the sterile procedures. So when you include the Da Vinci in a new surgical operating theater, you have to bag all of the armatures that are coming off of this robot. And so the actual um, tools that are going inside the patient, they're made of metal and so they can be sterilized. But then there's a lot of components of the the robot that are plastic and they have to be bagged and wrapped in, you know, these sterile um, bags before they can be incorporated into the the operating theater. And so there are a lot of things to consider in terms of policy. So, but I think they're, they seem to be working through it pretty well. There's a lot of, a lot of different robots that you can use in medical procedures. So they're, they're finding ways to, incorporate them all right so what's next in in medical development yeah, are we going to invest in in uh, robotics like what what is the future for uh, for medical development well i think the biggest thing is going to be providing that haptic feedback 
to the surgeons. That's the the thing that they all say when you ask them, you know, what's the biggest problem with the current robotic um, devices is I can't feel what I'm doing to my patient anymore. And so they have to have that haptic feedback. And I think we're really close. Um, there's a lot of great researchers working on that. So uh, I think it's it's getting there. Um, and I think that apart from the haptic feedback, I think it's going to be making the robots small enough and yet strong enough mm. to do the procedures that we need them to do. And I think that's where flexible manipulators are going to come in because they have that strength, but they also have this ability to be flexible in their environment and change their stiffness to reflect what's needed for the procedure. Awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. Oh, we do get have to have to have to <laughs> feedback. Yeah. Like, it seems like you're giving have a robot. It yeah. <laughs> <laughs> seems like we're giving uh, robots a sense of touch. Like that would be amazing. Yeah. And, like you just type in a number. Like hey, you're going through X thing. Like make sure it doesn't. You don't. I don't know. Go through. Go through the person and the table. <laughs> You could go with a person who will make a mistake one day, who will be tired, who had too much coffee that day, <laughs> who could slip. Like, but a robot is like, they're not going to make a mistake at the yeah. same rate that a human being does. So you want to talk about consistency in surgery. And then the idea of it being uh, small, like laparoscopic, then like robots are the way to go. Like it, they could literally go through the a pinhole. Mm-hmm. Like, but what she's saying about haptic feedback is seems like, paramount to get to making like what also what she was saying the um making the robotic a partner instead of just a tool Mm. because right now it sounds like they're not necessarily they're not necessary um they help in a small way but we've already got the the methods of like laparoscopic surgery that makes makes you know smaller incisions and streamline time and um, the surgeon can do it all with manual tools but once we get that haptic feedback um, programmed into a robotic, then we can almost we can almost start to trust that robotic to be able to perform those procedures, like you said, without going through the table and just going, "Oh, oops! Well, that was the quickest way from A to B." <laughs> like, like we need we need the uh, the robotic to be able to feel what's going on, and understand the body as a a feeling thing and not just a a working table, yeah. you know. Which is my, my biggest fear, and I, I bet a lot of people feel the same way, is that I don't want the robot to freak out, like glitch out, and then shoot through my heart. Like, I, you know what I mean? Like, we've all had tools, yeah. or like, like, just imagine people who play video games. Like, we've all had that one where the guy just decides that, oh, all right, I'm no longer playing, and then he runs into the stands, and it just disappears, because he just glitches out. <laughs> That's like, a thing. Yeah, he just shoots the basketball and it just hits the roof. All right, like it, just, it just hits the roof of the stadium. Just <laughs> or like you're you're playing a boxing game and it's like they're fighting each other and then all of a sudden someone's arm pops off. Like oh, robots, God. robots glitch out every once in a while. Yeah, they get like, weird. It my, seems like you could put checks and balances inside of it anyway, though. Yeah, so that wouldn't happen. My other concern, my last one here, is that like, what if zombies? What? So just say 20 years from now, the uh, the surgeons get super used. They uh, medical schools all use these robotics. Oh. Everybody's gotten used to them. They're co- they're commonplace now. The robotics is a partner in uh, in surgical techniques, and and the surgeon he fully relies on the on the robotics to do these techniques. They, there's not even talk of how to do it manually with like a, a traditional scalpel and like tweezer things. I don't. I don't know, <laughs> but so okay. So all of a sudden, the Wi-Fi goes out on on Doctor Robot Robotico, and what is the surgeon? What good is the surgeon then at that point? Like, what can he do? He he doesn't even do stitches. He hasn't done stitches in fifteen years because Doctor Robotico can do stitches and like he can throw a hundred stitches in two minutes. It's like. Yeah, we, but at the same yeah, time, we, like we had like doctors do what they've been doing for so long. Like I'd imagine that the doctors before like they roll out the dusty old surgeon who yeah. who, who remembers like, yeah <laughs> the manual technique. <laughs> oh no! I mean, or or like you can make the argument that like medical progress is medical progress. Like you could say that 
if you knocked out the Wi-Fi like worldwide, like we'd be facing some other issues. Like if there were no internet, we'd be facing some other issues as well. We, we're going to be sent back to the Stone Age no matter what. So yeah, yeah surgeons are probably going to suck for another hundred years. Yeah, you just took That's out, true. took out all their tools. We can't be scared of the of zombies and the EMPs. Yeah. Like we're back to the, uh, to keep us from like progressing. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, we're getting sent by this own age. We'll be back to like the four humors and, and Freudian psychology, like in no time. All right, that's it. All right, uh, go to parsec.org and register for a profile. It's free. Um, and join the membership. Join the membership package. Uh, what do we call it? Membership package? Uh, on parsec.org? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you call that. All right, yeah. <laughs> join, get the membership package yeah. where you can be a member of the uh, first. I get a social network. That's right. Yeah. Later. Bye.